Let's pause a moment in brief prayer. May the words that I speak and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Before I I get into the the main point of my um, sermon, I just want to give you a wee bit of background around the, the letter to the Ephesians. Paul wrote the epistle to the Ephesians whilst he was a prisoner, possibly during his first imprisonment in Rome, which was around AD 60 to 62. The letter was written to the church that he had nurtured for three years whilst staying in the home of Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus in around AD 53 to 56, probably during his third missionary journey. The letter, this letter deals with the worldwide church, the head of which is Christ, and the purpose of which is to be the instrument for making God's plan of salvation known throughout the universe. The letter speaks of the church as the true body of Christ, and salvation for the faithful depends on their commitment to Christ. Our salvation depends on our commitment to Christ. So it's within this context that we consider our passage for today. And our our passage, really, it's about highlighting the importance, or I'd like to highlight the importance of the armor of God. And in particular, that last bit about the power of prayer. Now, I don't know about you, And maybe it's me getting older or whatever else. And maybe I'm reflecting on life as it used to be and looking through my rose-tinted glasses. But sometimes, do you not feel that you can be surprised at the evil in our world? The seemingly nice person or good neighbor who suddenly turns nasty the respectable public figure who has some hidden exposed um, sins exposed, the person we love and thought we knew who shows a hidden dark side. Evil touches us all. We see it every day in the stories about young people being shot and murdered in streets. Okay, maybe not up here, but you know, you look at London and Manchester and these sorts of places, and it's almost a, it feels like it's almost a daily occurrence. The stories of human trafficking, the victims of human trafficking, the stories of the abused children, stories of people being made homeless through the evilness of drink and drugs. And the list goes on and on. And evil can touch us personally as well. It may be in the workplace. It may be due to unfairness, lies, and ethical demands. It may be in our families, broken trust, insensitivity, or pain. It may be in our bodies through depression or addiction. It may even be in our minds through lust or doubt or fear. And Paul in this epistle to the Ephesians reminds us that we have received every spiritual blessing in and through Jesus Christ. And that as Christians, we must learn to enjoy all that we have received from him. Learn to walk out the spiritual reality that is ours in Christ today. But Paul also reminds us and warns us here in this passage that in the walk there is war and in that war we must learn to stand. 
Make no mistake, the enemy, the evil one, wants to take us all out. He wants to own us. He wants to to take us as his own. Now, whatever the cause, there is no doubt that evil is real and is powerful. Just remember, just look at your Bibles and read what Paul says in verse 11. The devil is real. The evil one is real. But he is not equal with God. Unlike God, the evil one is not omnipotent. That is all powerful. Neither is he omnipresent. He is not present everywhere in the world at the same time. Yet, he certainly is powerful. And he is active on the earth. In the book of Revelation, at chapter 12 and verses 7 to 9, we are given a picture of where the evil one is today. And I read, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. That is the devil. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough. And they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down. That ancient serpent serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the entire world astray. He was hurled down to the earth and his angels with him. We also know that the evil one directs powerful evil forces. At at verse 12 of our, our passage, Paul writes, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So from verse 12, let me as a start, highlight four potential ways that the evil one might affect us. Rulers and authorities. This might be institutions or societies such as governments or political leaders or even religious organizations. Similarly, powers of this dark world might include cultural idols, Influencers on social media. Rich and powerful people who control the economy. Lobbyists and special interest groups. Drug rings, dra- uh, gangs, etc. Now, I'm not for a second suggesting that all rulers and authorities are evil or under the influence of, the, of evil but some are. And finally, we have spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, including evil spirits, unrecognized in our culture. Whether they are demons or less personal forces of spiritual evil, many people today are oppressed spiritually in ways that are hard to explain. Therefore, our struggle against the powers of evil can seem like an unfair fight. Evil appears as everywhere. And we often feel powerless to influence the world governments, politics, culture, movements, economies, and even social problems. There's evil in us as well. Let's be fair, let's be frank, let's be honest. Every one of us here struggles with the forces that might seem impossible to overcome at some point. Yet, as Paul reminds us in verse 10, there is hope for us in this situation, in our situation. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
So what can we do? Well, let's remember, God's power is greater than any evil power. The power of God is revealed through us throughout the Bible. He brought the people, his people, out of Egypt and made them into a strong nation. He preserved a remnant of his people even when they were went into captivity because of their sin. And there are other examples throughout the Old Testament. So let's then fast forward, if you like, into the New Testament. When Jesus came into the world, he showed his power as the Son of God by healing and casting out demons. The ultimate demonstration of his power came when evil was at its worst. Jesus was crucified, dead and buried. But then he broke the power of evil and death by rising from the dead. The cross was a power struggle between the powers of evil and the powers of God. And the power of God was shown to be stronger when Jesus was raised to life. In times of evil, what do we do? What has God's people always done? God's people have prayed. We pray. Prayed against the forces of evil. Prayed for mercy to be shown to them. And in all the great moves of God throughout history, prayer, whether corporate or personal, has played and remains a key role in the ongoing fight against evil. For our God is an ever-listening God, listening to the heart of his children and always acting accordingly. The power of prayer against evil. So what does this mean for us? I suppose in a way it's a a bit like being afraid of a bully who's bigger and stronger and meaner than we are. Yet we have a big brother or sister or whatever who has already fought and beaten the bully. We don't need to be afraid. At the mention of our big brother, the bully leaves us alone. God is our protector. And at the mention of his name, the evil one will flee. It is through wearing the power, the armor of God that includes praying in the Spirit that we can find our peace. We are far from powerless against the evil one. The power is the power of God that we have, that we are given. It is the power of prayer. That is why Paul says, be strong in the Lord. Now I'll come back to prayer in a moment. But let me highlight some of the other um, items in the armor of God. So for a moment, I want us to imagine Paul. Imagine Paul who writes as a prisoner in chains. He's looking at a soldier, the soldiers who are guarding him. And he imagines a Roman soldier fully equipped for battle. Without his armor and weapons, the soldier looks quite vulnerable. But dressed in his armor, with his weapons ready, the soldier is a formidable opponent. So with this in mind, with this picture in mind, Paul helps us through this passage 
to see how we can use God's power to defeat evil powers. Since our battle is against powerful spiritual forces, we need the power of God to overcome them. So Paul says, therefore put the armor of God on, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Now the thing about armor is that you need to put it on before the battle starts. There is no point trying to put your armor on in the heat of battle. So we need to be prepared at all times, especially when things appear to be going well. Because that's a, that's a, a point when, when things are going well, we think, oh, well, it's okay. Things are going well. We don't need to worry about it. Life's good. But it's at that time, it's at that time that we are at our most vulnerable. So each piece of the armor or weaponry that John read for us illustrates a way in which we can be strong. The belt of truth. We know that Satan's greatest weapon is de deception. Paul says that we should have the belt of truth buckled around our waist. Truth gets the confusion that evil brings out of the way. So be truthful at all times. The breastplate of righteousness. As we put on the breastplate and look at ourselves in the mirror, we should see ourselves clothed in righteousness of Christ. That helps us to resist evil. Then let's take the shield of faith, which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Our faith, our belief in Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior is our defense against the evil one's arrows of doubt. The shield of faith, however, must be built up. We must, it must be built up by worshipping and thanking God, both individually and collectively, and through prayer. The helmet of salvation. Salvation is not only getting to heaven someday, Salvation is our health and wholeness in Christ. Paul tells us to get healthy spiritually, physically, emotionally, and in our relationship with each other. And that is something we need to work on. It just doesn't just happen. Where is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the sword is an offensive weapon which enables us to strike back against temptation and pressure. When Jesus was tempted, he responded to the devil by quoting Scripture. How did he know Scripture so well? He studied it. He even memorized it. The word of God is a defense against the attacks of the evil one. The last piece of weaponry, the final piece of the jigsaw, is to pray in the spirit. When we face spiritual battles, prayer connects us with God through the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verse 26 says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness when we do not know what we ought to do, to, ought to pray for. The Spirit himself intercedes for us. So as I said in the children's talk earlier, we can and indeed must pray in the Spirit at all times. So I wonder, 
Why is prayer so important? Well, prayer is the way that we can approach a difficult situation, a difficult problem. It gives us the extra strength we need to complete a difficult task or to find a solution to a tough problem. It protects us from evil as well. And what do we pray for? Well, Paul reminds us to pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. So don't just pray about the seemingly important things in in life. Do you know, sometimes, sometimes the battle is won in the seemingly trivial things that we pray for and we ask for. Paul also reminds us to pray for all the saints. In other words, pray for fellow Christians. We are not alone in this battle. Never feel that you are alone in the battle against evil. We are concerned for others who face temptation, oppression, sickness, or evil circumstances. Sometimes the only way we can help is to pray. And that, my friends, is what we should do. When we pray for other believers, and even when we pray for those who are not believers, whether family members, friends, or others that we know, we pray that they might be strong and wise, protected and led by the power of God. And we also need to pray for ourselves. Let's not forget ourselves. We need to pray for ourselves and support our prayers by good habits to build up the armor that God has provided for us. When we pray in the Spirit, we should be asking God to reveal our weaknesses, to fix the cracks in our armor, and to prepare us to overcome the challenges that we face and we will face in the coming days. We cannot, we cannot overcome these challenges on our own. So Paul tells us to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So in conclusion, prayer should be a key piece of our armor. We need all the bits of the armor to gain full protection. Yet prayer is the piece of the armor that we often overlook and forget. So in all weaponry provided for us in this spiritual fight, let us not forget prayer. When I come to pray, I often feel like I'm that I'm bringing five loaves and two fishes. Meager, small, seemingly worthless. But do you know what? In passing through the hands of Christ, they are more than enough. So my friends, my plea to you is to bring your feeble hearts to God. Cry out to him through prayer as best you can. Talk to him about the cares of life. For he cares for you. He cares for all of us. And as you pray, as you pray, never forget that you are taking up a great weapon. A great weapon that will protect you in this time of spiritual warfare. In this fight against the evil one. Why? Because God in his might, he hears our cry. He hears the cry of his people. So take your prayers to him who listens. So, in conclusion, 
Let us say the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray. They're up on the screen there for us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forevermore. Amen.